home while we're singing Easter songs. <laughs> Lord, we are ready. And if you don't come back, I pray we would sing and worship you until you do. Maranatha, Lord, we choose to worship you. We pray in the only name that we can, because apart from your name and your blood, we have no right. But we come boldly through the name of Jesus. We come boldly covered by the blood of Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Don't hold back. Can we say something? Can we say hallelujah? Hallelujah. For the cross. Hallelujah. For the stone that was rolled away. Hallelujah for the empty tomb. Hallelujah for my Savior. Can we worship this morning, church? It's not rhetorical. Can we worship this morning, church? Let's worship the Lord.
No one. 
This is a world. This is a world. Here in the flat, living among the weak and lowly, the voice of God is every breath. Salvation of the The devil has to bow at the name of 
you will be glorified you are God but I pray it would happen in every single person in this room every single person that's watching this service that you would fill them to overflowing that you would change us Lord that you would renew us that you would empower us that you would heal where it's needed Lord that you'd give hope where hope's been lost Lord that you would have your way because you are good. Everything you do is good. And you always finish what you start. So Lord, finish the work that you have intended in every heart that's here and watching right now. We give this service to you. We praise the name of Jesus because you are worthy. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. And we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord one more time. You can have a seat if you're standing up. I'm going to quickly give you just a few announcements, um, and then we're going to jump into God's Word together. We're going to be in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. First announcement is for the men. Men, there is a men's retreat 
And believe it or not, that is next month. So it's coming up. Today is the last day to pay the cheapest price. And I'm all about getting the cheapest price for me and everybody else. So today's the day. Uh, sign up through today. It's, it, you save about 40 bucks, I think, or more. And so we'd love for you to sign up at that price. Uh, and you can sign up after that. You just pay a little bit more. Um, so uh, sign up for that. Uh, it's a different retreat center than we've ever been before with the men. There are only two guys per room, and so you can choose wisely, and you will actually get to sleep. If you want to make sure you sleep, you just have to fork out the extra money. You can get your own room. So um, no excuses. Uh, we want you to come. It's going to be an awesome time in the Word together, awesome time bonding with other men and uh, growing in our relationship with the Lord. VBS, I'm mentioning it for two reasons. It's June 7th through the 10th. Number one reason is we want you to bring kids, grandkids, um, celebrate. We didn't have VBS last year, which was super sad, but we're having it this year, which is super exciting. So uh, we want you to be a part of that. You can sign up uh, to help down at the uh, children's area, down at the end of the hall. If you're watching online, you can sign up online if you're ready to come be a part of that. And the last announcement I'm super excited about because we are going to Israel during Sukkot. In fact, all of Sukkot, all of the Feast of Tabernacles will take place while we're there. For, if you go on this trip, this is unique. Even if you've ever been, we're going to be a part of a parade through the streets of Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to Jewish people. It's incredible. Uh, we're going to have a, a concert at the Dead Sea because you know it's not always going to be the Dead Sea, right? It's coming back to life. Um, if you've read the whole Bible, it's in there. Trust me, if you haven't, it's in there. It's happening. And uh, wouldn't it be cool if we were hanging out there when Jesus decided to come back. I, I, I think it'd be cool. If you don't, um, what's wrong with you? Uh, it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm not, I can't guarantee he's coming back while we're on the trip. I'm just going to say, can't guarantee that. But I can guarantee he'll show up in a powerful way and speak to you. So those are the announcements. The biggest announcement is this. He is risen. Screaming is good. But the, the response that we're going to go with for the rest of the service you can scream with it. It's cool. Is he is risen indeed, right? And some of you know it. You, you, you're like, why did that person scream? Because they're excited. That's why they screamed. It's cool too. But let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I got a woohoo there too. That's cool. I didn't. Jesus did, but I got to hear it. He hears you. So this is how I make sure you're awake on Easter is that I say that phrase and then you say your phrase and then I know everyone's awake, and it's, it's encouraging that you're still awake. It's encouraging. So I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to ask a question. It's kind of a series of questions in one big old question. I, uh, I was dwelling on this last year, since last Easter, and I had some thoughts about it, and I, I processed some things, and I want to ask you this question. Have you ever had the feeling, that sinking feeling, when you've been in the midst of struggle or pain or doubt or fear or confusion and you look back and you see all this pain in your life and then you look forward and all you see is more struggle and pain and confusion. I see two heads nodding. Anybody else? You've been in that place? Maybe you have. Maybe you, you got to that place where you thought, I don't know how to move forward because you looked behind you at all the struggle. You looked to the left, to the right, and then you looked forward and all you saw was a brick wall. And you wondered, how do I get past this? How do I get to this living hope that people always talk about? Because I have some hope, but it's waning. Maybe you've been in that place where hope started to decrease, where it started to wane. I'm going to tell you, I had a few of those moments in the last year where I thought, what's going to happen? How bad is it going to get? I realize some of you, when I say that, have it a lot worse than, than me in this last year. Where you've lost people close to you. Where you've struggled through something like losing your job or losing hope just completely in, in thinking about going forward. I think for a lot of us, the last year has been a little bit of that. Or maybe a whole lot of that. Just wondering, how do I go forward? How do I get out of this? But thank God, we have a Savior who gives living hope. Not just hope. 
It's different. It's different. A lot of people have hope momentarily. If you choose to receive it, we have living hope. Why do we have living hope? Because our Savior, who created the universe, died and then rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. I mean, you cheered louder than that if you're a Gonzaga fan last night. Are there any Gonzaga fans in here? There are. There are. I'll share my part of that story in a second. But here's what happened. I was thinking about this struggle that many of us have faced, and I was thinking about feeling just overwhelmed. You know what I thought about when I thought about getting ready for this Easter Sunday morning? I remembered last Easter. And there was nobody here. Nobody. There was the worship team. There were like six of us. I had the worship team sit one in each section. So, so when I looked around, I wouldn't be looking at an empty seat. Because when I look at cameras, I get really nervous. And it helped a little bit, but praise Jesus, there's people in here. And if you're watching online, I'm glad you're there too. It just helps when there's actually people in here too. Because I can't see you. So I started praying, and I got this picture in my mind. It's not my picture. It's God's picture. But we've been studying the book of Exodus. Some of you know that. If you've been watching online, if you've been here, and we've been going through the book of Exodus, and this is the picture I got. I got a picture of the children of Israel leaving bondage in Egypt, leaving set free, and they're so excited, and they're moving forward. And then all of a sudden, they hear this sound that I'm sure made their hearts sink. Because they had left all that bondage, and then they heard the sound of chariots rolling through the desert, chasing them down. That would be like us hearing tanks coming, and we're just walking down the street. You're in trouble. There's no way you're going to overcome Pharaoh's army riding on chariots. Two to three million former slaves going through the desert, and that's what they hear coming behind them. And they look to the left, and they look to the right, and there's mountains. And then they look forward, and what do they see? They see a massive sea in front of them. But thank God for a Savior who shows up. Because I believe when that pillar of cloud went behind them, it was Jesus Christ himself. You know where he went first? He didn't part the sea first. He went behind them to guard them from behind. All those struggles, all that pain, all the death that, that many of their family members had endured and the loss and the grief and the struggle for all those generations, hundreds of years, he guards them from going back. And then even better than that, he splits the sea right in front of them. And you go, man, that's cool. I've heard that story before. That's a cool story. Here's what I want you to see today. I want you to hear in the story of the resurrection and in the hope we have going forward in this life that we have that same hope. That God wants to part the seas. He wants to remove the things that separate you from the promised land, from being in his presence there. What separates you from living hope? Because he wants to split the sea open. He wants to guard you from behind. And he wants to come beside you and carry you forward. Some of you are like, oh, I'm already going forward. Some of you are still stuck. And you're struggling. That's what we're going to talk about. The hope that we have. I, I gave the title to the message today in Mark 16. I'm just going to read eight verses here. The stone of separation. Because there was a stone that separated those who came from the living hope found in Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. Mark 16, you can follow along. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, they waited, right? Because they didn't do anything on the Sabbath. So they're waiting. They came as soon as they could. The women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him very early in the morning on the first day of the week. That's why we're here on a Sunday. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, watch this, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? You would think they would think that out before they got there. But when they looked up, 
They saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. I encourage you to underline that if it's not underlined, underlined already in your Bible. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe. It's an angel sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Angels have that effect. I, I long to be around angels um, but I'm thinking this side of heaven, it's scary because everyone's scared. They're just impressive beings. That's what I'm thinking. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. Even when angels say it, you respond the same way. I hope more so if an angel shows up and tells you he is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter. I love that. I have it highlighted in my Bible, just that part, and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. That's not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. That's a very pointed thing that's there. Forever, and Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. I love this line too. I, don't, I need to underline this. I don't know why it's not underlined in this Bible. As he said to you. He always does what he says. He already told them this. But a stone had separated. Death had separated them from living hope. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, and they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. These women were determined. They went anyway. They were the last ones to see Jesus alive. They were there at the cross. They were determined. They went anyway. What do we mean anyway? They went anyway, even not knowing how they're going to get in. They went anyway, even knowing he was knowing he was dead. They went anyway, even though there was risk involved, possibly imprisonment, possibly death. There were soldiers there guarding this tomb. It was a big deal for them to go. They took a big risk. They had seen the mocking and the scourging and the crucifixion. Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is finished. The spear going in his side, him being laid down in a tomb. They had seen all of it. And yet they went anyway. Why did they go? Not rhetorical. Why did they go? I got a couple different answers. Um, I don't think they did get living hope. I don't think they went with hope of a risen Savior. I don't. I think they went to perform a duty to put oil and spices. It says that part here. And I think they went to do that because they love Jesus so much. Even though he was dead, they wanted to honor him, even if it would be at risk of their lives. So they went anyway. They expected to find a dead body. If they thought he was going to be risen from the dead, they wouldn't have taken spices and oil. They brought spices and oil because they were going to embalm, cover him, so that the decay would be delayed so that the smell would be diminished, so they could honor him because they loved him. Let me ask you a question. I know it doesn't apply directly, but indirectly it does. Do you love him enough to pursue him even in the biggest struggles of your life? To go anyway, to pursue him anyway. They went anyway. You don't expect living people in places where dead people are laid. I worked in a morgue. I didn't work specifically in the morgue, but I went into the morgue many times. I worked in a hospital, a couple jobs, taking bodies there, going to move bodies, helping them to load up bodies or whatever. Let me tell you something. I did not expect to find anyone living when I went alone down there. But I will tell you, and I've said it before, there's always this little bit of concern if you do. And I think God placed that in us because what it is, it is hope beyond death. I think it's been placed in us by him. Now, 
I've got a story that I'll share another time. I'm going to go back to this story. They come here not expecting a risen Lord, but they go anyway. They are discouraged. They've lost hope, and yet they're being faithful. You have to be faithful even when you don't see it, when you don't know, but you know him. Reminds me of my favorite story that Max Lucado, or Lucado, I don't know the correct correct pronunciation. Max Lucado tells this story of Chippy the parakeet. Have you heard it? It's worth hearing. Let me read it to you. Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. It's a true story, by the way. One minute he was peacefully perched inside his birdcage, and the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. His problems began when Chippy's owner decided to vacuum out his birdcage. She stuck the attachment inside the cage, and about that time the telephone rang, and she looked away and being distracted. When she turned back, Chippy was gone. She immediately hung up the telephone and looked inside the vacuum bag, and there was Chippy. Sure enough, there he was, alive but stunned. Since he was covered with dirt and debris, she grabbed him, and she raced down the hallway to the bathroom where she stuck him under cold water in the sink for about three minutes. So she realized he was shivering and soaked, still shocked and stunned. So she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She grabbed the hairdryer. She blasted him with the hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. Several days later, the reporter who covered the story called to see how Chippy's recovery was coming along. The owner said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits there and stares. There's way too many chippies in the last year. Just staring like into the wall and thinking, you know, what do we do? We've been sucked up, washed over, and blown away. I had my moments, man. I'm like, that's me. I'm chippy. Keep on seeking him. Keep on pursuing him. Because let me guarantee you this. If you keep on pursuing Jesus, you'll always find the same thing. Life. Life. Living hope. Living hope. They come to this stone. And then I don't know when they discovered the the idea that we maybe should have thought of how we're going to move the stone. They were just determined to go. They were like, well, just go. And they get there. And the stone was already rolled away. But that's not what they knew was going to happen. They're wondering, how are we going to do it? Remember, the stone was how big? What does it say? Very large. I looked it up. I did a word study. I spent some time looking up the Koine Greek, the original Greek. Very large. In the original means very large. <laughs> Two to 4,000 pounds. That's what most people think. Two to 4,000 pounds. I don't know. I mean, there's some strong women in here, but I don't know how many of you are just like, let's go move it. (laughs) Maybe you can do it. I can't. And they get there and they're thinking, what are we going to do? It's too big. What are the obstacles keeping you from the blessing of God, from the living hope that he has to give you? Is it depression? Is it COVID? Is it the loved one that you've lost this year or loved ones? Is it financial struggles or that you lost your job or that you're depressed? Or is it shame or guilt or sin or addiction or fear or loneliness? Whatever it is, keep pushing forward. Because let me tell you something. You know what the story of my life is? He's already rolled the stone away. Does that mean I'm not going to go through struggle? No, they went through struggle. Jesus died. He was dead. But when they got there, the stone was already rolled away. They worried about the stone. You know, I read an article uh, years ago that said that 85% of what we worry about never happens. And of the 15% remaining, 12% of it is not as bad as what we thought it was going to be. So you're left with 3%. And let me tell you something. He can handle 3%. He can handle 100%. But they go there. The stone has been rolled away. They didn't even know how they were going to deal with the Roman soldiers. He dealt with them too. Those poor guys. I mean, don't you feel a little bit bad for them? 
not really. Jesus does what we can't do. Jesus was risen from the dead. He is risen. Few of you are losing that quick response. I'll give you one more chance at least. So I have to say this is the greatest comeback ever. This is like the greatest victory in the history of the universe. I watched that basketball game last night. My wife went to UCLA. I worked at UCLA. I was rooting for UCLA. I was so hopeful at the end of regulation. How many of you watched the game? I'm talking to about five people in here. For the rest of you, the other team, you know, on a, on a 50-50 call, went in overtime, and then won on a shot just inside a half court that banked in. He did not do that on purpose. I don't care what anybody tells you. I was watching that game, and I just, I sat there in shock at the end of the game. And there's another brother in the congregation. He'll be here in the next service. We, we were like in misery together, texting back and forth. And I started thinking of all the greatest comebacks in history, in sports. I'm a big sports fan. My dad's a basketball coach. I grew up playing basketball. And the greatest comeback I've ever heard about, I was actually there, but I was a little kid. So I don't remember. I didn't know what was going on. But my parents, my dad tells me the story. He's told it to me a few times. We were at a high school basketball game. The church that I uh, went to when I was a little kid had a gym, a really nice gym. So they would rent it. Uh, high school teams would rent it for tournaments and things. And, and it had a locker room underneath the, in the basement below the gym. It was pretty cool. And we went to a game and my dad tells me this story. One team came all the way back to be within one point. But at the very end of the game, um, they, they, they just weren't able to do it. And right as the buzzer was about to sound, the coach on the team that won by one point was chewing out the refs. He just laying into them, even though they were about to win. The game was, the time was expiring. The horn sounded, the game was over. They had won and he just kept on chewing the refs out. And the ref just stared at him and went like this. You know what they did? My dad was at the game. I was there too, but I was this little kid. They went down into the locker room to get a player from the team that lost to come back and shoot four free throws. They were down by one point. I don't know how many you made. I got to get that part from my dad, but more than one. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't just come up from the locker room. He was dead. I, I wish, and maybe someday there'll be a replay in heaven. I don't know. I wish we could see Satan's face. Because let me tell you something. As my dad tells the story, that coach's face <laughs> that took two technicals. Satan didn't just take technicals. He took one to the teeth. He, he was overcome. He thought he had the victory, and it was stripped away by Jesus Christ. Amen? And we live in that victory. We live in that victory. The stone was rolled away. What does that mean? You know, nothing in the Gospels actually tells us about the resurrection when it happened. You know that? All it says is there was an empty tomb. There is the part where Jesus shows up and starts talking to people and comes through walls and stuff. Pretty cool. But nobody tells us in the Gospels the actual moment. They all show up there. And you know what the greatest evidence was initially? Nothing. The fact that there was nothing in the tomb. Later that he was walking around and appearing to people. That's pretty good evidence too. But let me tell you something. The empty tomb, the resurrection is the greatest moment in all of history. And it gives us living hope. It means he is he was. It means you can get through the struggle that you're in, no matter what. Even if you die, guess what? You'll get through the struggle. And you'll be in his presence face to face. God did not ultimately forsake his son. It means that too. He was forsaken when he became sin, but here, raised to life, taking his life back. Sin and death are conquered. It means that too. Is that pretty good news for you? I hope you understand that's pretty good. Better than a half court shot. It's better. The stone that separated you from living hope has been removed. Amen. I don't know what that is for you. 
but let it be removed. Let it be removed. Let it be rolled away. Fear, doubt, confusion, depression, sickness, grief. Let it be rolled away. Let God move it. Let him move it. So quick story before we wrap up this last little section. We had some foundation work done at our house. And they tell you when they do foundation work, we had 18 piers put, four internal and 14 piers in the front of our house. It was a pain, but we had to do it, and it was a big problem. And so they went in there, and they tell you, when we're done, we're going to put the bushes back. So I asked the guy, are they going to live? And he said, it could happen. They put them back. They didn't even bury the roots. The dude just laid them against a tree in the middle of the summer and then threw them back there. And, and they were dead. They were dead when he put them back, and they stayed dead. So we went to go re-landscape the whole front of our house. Let's spend some more money. woo I hate spending money. I'm cheap. My wife goes and buys some plants. We get some plants at Lowe's or wherever we went. I don't remember where she went. We picked out some plants. I think she did most of it. Oh, it was at Covington's. She went to Covington's. We picked out the plants, and she buys the plants. And then she goes, I want to buy two more plants. She calls me on the phone. I want to buy two more. And I'm like, okay, buy two more. And then it hit me. I'm like, how much do they cost? And she said, well, they're kind of expensive, but they're beautiful. And they're going to finish it out and they'll bring, you know, symmetry. And, you know, she had this whole thing. And I'm like, I'm, so some of the people know me, people who work here know me. I'm cheap. Um, you can call it other things, but I'm cheap. And, and frugal, whatever you want to call it, I'm okay with it. I'm cheap. But here's the thing. She goes, it's going to cost. And I don't, I don't remember how much. I just knew it was not tens. It was hundreds of dollars for each plant. These are plants. They're not going to heaven. And, and so we get the plants, and, and I said yes. And I was so happy, and they looked awesome, and there they were. And then we get this winter storm. And I covered them. I covered them with bags. I covered them with mattress pads. I covered them with sheets, layers and layers. And I'm like, this is hundreds of dollars right here. I have to protect it. And I covered them. And then seven days later, not three, but seven days later, I pulled them off and they were dead. They were dead. And I was angry. I really was. I was sad. I was angry. And I said to my wife, what are we going to do? I said, let's dig them up and throw them out now. Because I don't like dead things hanging around. And she said, no, wait. I'm like, for what? They're dead. Every leaf is dead. The whole thing looks dead to me. And she said, wait. And I go out there about a week ago, and it was alive. Both of them. They're alive. I, I should have taken a picture. I'm going to bring a picture. They're alive. They once were dead, but now they're alive. And I, I didn't waste hundreds of dollars. I want you to do something on your way home. Look at every plant that looked dead that came back to life. And if you had Indian hawthorns, they're dead. They're like unsaved people who just said no, 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 no. I saw a guy buying 50 Indian Hawthorns at Lowe's yes, yesterday. And I'm like, dude, don't buy those. <laughs> They're all dead. I didn't have to worry about it. The guys who dug out my house, they killed those. But Jesus brings life from death. Amen. And you drive home. I drove here on the way just looking at every tree that is budding and is sprouting. Life always overcomes. To quote Jurassic Park, life always wins. I got one more point. It's quick. Really quick. They were sent out. And what were they told? Go tell the disciples and Peter. By the way, the angel told us, Peter, to tell all the disciples and you. Why is that so cool? Why is it so important? Because the last time we see Peter, he's weeping because he failed again and again and again. And he denied Jesus Christ. And he thought it was over. Just over. But it's a picture of grace. Some of you think that that stone that separates you is permanent. Because you've messed up too bad. You don't have hope anymore. And you think, this is it. This is it. There's no coming back from this. 
Our God always wins. He is risen. They told him. And I think there are angels in heaven waiting for you to hear. Whatever separates you from living hope, he's rolled it out of the way. Or he will do it if you let him. Some of your hearts are sealed up. Because of your own sin, because of addictions, because of fear, because of doubt, because of loss. I've talked to some people, even this last week, who've lost loved ones to COVID or something else in this year, and they think, you know what? I don't know if I trust God at all. Pray, I won't even give you his name, but pray for a gentleman that, that told me that. I said, I want to share hope with you. And he said, I, I don't trust him. He is trustworthy. If anyone can bring hope in the midst of death, it's the one who died and rose again. What's your stone? What separates you? Let him roll it away. Because that empty tomb wasn't just an empty tomb, it was a launch pad for Jesus to go out and bring living hope. Amen. If you're able to stand, I'm going to have you stand. I got one more story. I'm weird. Stories flashed through my mind when I was driving here. I wrote it down in my notes. And it's a story my wife told me. Her her friends, they had a a fish tank, a beautiful fish tank. Some of you have heard the story before. And the guy got a piranha, this friend of hers. I don't know how he got a piranha, but he got a piranha, put it in the tank. And guess what? It started eating all the other fish. So he took it out and he, and he, he wanted to get rid of it, but he wanted the jaws of the piranha. So he threw it into the freezer and two or three days later, he pulled it out and he put it on the cutting board and he started with a steak knife trying to cut out the jaws. And guess what? That thing started flopping on the cutting board. It came back to life. And I don't know why I'm telling you that, except Jesus is scarred, but he is alive and well. He's not going to eat you, but he wants (laughs) <laughs> he wants to have you, your life. He wants to give you his life. Let's pray. Lord, in all my craziness, I pray the message of your truth would come through. Lord, I pray for the person in here who feels far from you, who feels hopeless, who feels lost, alone who feels grief like I may not have any idea of. I pray for the person who doesn't trust you, who hasn't trusted you. I pray for the person who trusted you a long time ago and they don't right now. They've walked away because of all the struggles. I pray for the person who says they've trusted you or walked an aisle or got baptized, but they've never truly given their life to you as Savior and Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would roll away the stone. That you would take our heart of stone, Lord, and replace it with a heart of flesh. That you would soften our hearts, Lord. I pray that no one would walk out of here hopeless, alone. I pray, Lord, that you would show up right now. In Jesus' name we pray. As we're in an attitude of prayer, we're still praying. If you are here today and you've lost hope, or you're not sure you've ever had it, but you want to know living hope, you want to know where you're going to be for all eternity with confidence. You want the stone that separates you from living hope, that separates you from the Lord to be rolled back for the first time or again, if that's you, As we're in an attitude of prayer, I'm not doing this to call people out. I'm doing this to call you to him, for him to call you to himself. As we're in an attitude of prayer, if that's you, I'm just going to do this quickly. I'm not going to call you up here, but I want to know to pray for you. So if that's you, as as heads are bowed, if you will just quickly, I'm going to scan through the room. If you'll look up at me and just say, I want to have that hope. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Make sure you look up till I, till I see you or yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. 
I see somebody, I think, back there. Yeah, anybody else before we, I'm going to scan back through. Yeah. Lord, I don't know if I see them all, but you do. And Lord, the few that I saw, I pray, Lord, you would rush in like a mighty wind and fill them with hope. Lord, roll back the stones in, in the hearts of those who have not yet trusted you that maybe didn't look up. Lord, those that have trusted you at some point, but Lord, we are like chippy today, just staring, wondering. Lord, I pray that that living hope would invade our souls, our spirits, our hearts, and fill us with joy. Lord, restore unto every single person in here the joy of their salvation or bring it for the first time. Lord Jesus, I pray you would minister to those who looked up, those that I saw, and those that I didn't. Those who didn't look up at all, but right now their hearts are lifted to you and they know they need to make a decision to let you roll away that stone, that it would be the disciples and Matt, the disciples and, put your name in there, that got living hope. Draw us back to you, Lord. I pray today would be the best resurrection Sunday we've ever experienced because your living hope overwhelms COVID. It overwhelms loss. It overwhelms even our grief because where oh death is your sting? Where oh sin is your, is your victory, Lord? Where is, where is the, the sting of death? Where is the victory of sin? It's gone. Jesus Christ, we come to you and I pray for those that you are stirring right now to truly pursue you anyways and see that the stone has been moved away, that you've given them living hope. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.